for coming. We appreciate the packed house. It's always fun when you get a lot of people in a room to listen to very informative topics and things that can help grow your business and grow you personally. So kudos to you for coming. Um, real quick, I am part of the professional development work group for the chamber here in town, and, and these are things that we are trying to put on monthly, different topics, different uh, businesses, different individuals that have different experiences to help grow. You guys are our members. So we appreciate you coming. If you have thoughts, ideas, know somebody that can get one of these and, and do a great job and reach out to somebody, let us know. We want to, like I said, we want to expand this. And it's the whole whole reason why Pearson Kelly's here today is we're in our group talking through who can give a speech on something that's not everyday things, that's not the, the same old, same old that you can go read a book about. You know, they're, they're, we need real life experiences, we need real life people to, to come give and information. So personally, my company does business with Chelsea and Emily. And so the way that we've had our interactions and done business with them, I thought it was extremely beneficial. So me learning through them, through business, has brought this head talk to the table. Um, so I'm going to introduce Kyle. He's the gentleman here in Joplin for Pearson Kelly, and then he'll, he'll do the rest. So thank you. Just like to thank everybody for coming out as well. I mean, uh, we can't control the weather, but uh, appreciate everybody sticking it out with us. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speakers today. We've got uh, Mr. Lee Flood. Uh, Lee is the president of uh, Pearson Kelly Technology. Um, he's been with us for eight years now um, on a pretty New York rise. Uh, started as a lowly salesman, and here he is today as the president. Um, Lee has been a foundational part, a very key player um, in the success and growth that Pearson Kelly has experienced. Um, we also have Ms. Chelsea Bodie. Chelsea is the owner and CEO of Pearson Kelly Technology. Um, she is our sixth employee. Um, Pearson Kelly started in 2004. She was number six and has kind of been with us every step of the way all along the journey. She's seen the entire development from beginning to end um, and is also a key, a key part of uh, where we are today. Thanks, Thank you. We really practice like the walk-in or anything that feels a little awkward yeah. now that we're doing it, but that's all right. So missing good. the music for sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So I'm Lee. This is Chelsea. Uh, and just to start off, uh, we are not experts at all. So hopefully, uh, we found out right before this. This is supposed to be educational. So you know, we're gonna have Kinsey add some slides with some information. Hopefully, that we can claim as education at the end. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but. We're not experts by any means, uh, so I was taught something whenever I was in junior high that said, uh, or a coach asked me, do you know the difference between a wise man, a smart man, and a dumb man? And he used a different word that I'm not going to use because it's recorded. Uh, but uh, the whole point of it was a wise man learns from others' mistakes, a smart man learns from his own, and a dumb man never learns. And so we don't claim to be wise by any means, but hopefully today we can pass along some information of some of the mistakes, the things that we've learned over the years and ways that we've grown uh, and save some of you from those same mistakes so you can all be wise. Uh, why would you listen to us? A little bit about Pearson Kelly. So uh, even through a little thing called COVID, which a large portion of our revenue and organization was on the print side and there wasn't a whole lot of people printing when that happened, right? Uh, we were still able to grow 50% through 2019 uh, we've had 20% growth in our employee uh, count uh, throughout that time to help match some of that revenue growth. So I know a lot of you, anyone here struggling to find people at all or get people to work? Yeah. So uh, we understand that um, and have still been able to recruit and retain talent throughout that process. Uh, and then last year, so one of the things we did is we won top five best places to work in 2021 uh, for Biz 417. And that wasn't Chelsea and Lee writing in about how awesome we were. Uh, they actually send out a survey, and 75% of that survey, uh, or the, the score that for us to get elected for that comes from compensation, benefits, and culture. And so they send that directly to our employees, and they fill it out, and it's anonymous, and we don't know what they say. Uh, so hopefully some of the things we've implemented since we took over EOS is helping us affect and, and get to that point. For you today, what to expect? Uh, we broke this down to three different things. So we talked about EOS, um, but the first thing is just what is an operating system? 
uh, and I know we've got an IT guy in here, but we're not talking about that kind and, and some others as well. So we're just talking about something for your organization. So we want to define that. So we're all talking about the same thing. We also want to talk about why, really Chelsea, but Pearson Kelly as a whole has picked EOS, which is Entrepreneurial Operating System. That was a mouthful. Uh, so why did we pick that? And then we're going to spend the majority of our time on how we have found success using it to build a winning culture. I'm being told to scoot down, sorry. So, good. So, what is an operating system? Uh, okay, to get us all on the same page, it's just the way we are all trying to organize all the human energy in our organization, right? So we all have lots of people working for us, or maybe even just a few, and it's how we go about organizing them to accomplish the goals that we want. So that's how we're gonna define an operating system. A lot of people are using their own self-grown methods. We were for a long time, and Chelsea kind of talked a tad on that uh, today. We picked something that helped us define it and build structure for that, how we meet, how we dial in the groups, how we define our departments, all those items to help us say, this set kind of a, a goal post or you know, a, a, an out of bounds line for where we needed to be, and so we could follow that. Who in this room would say that your company is using or following some form of operating system, out of curiosity? Who has more of like a homegrown method? Cool. So for us, we really fell in love with EOS or sometimes it's referred to Traction. Has anyone heard of Traction or EOS? Cool. Um, I hadn't at first and in fact, uh, we'll get to the Traction book here in a second, um, but really starting with one of their other family of books, uh, Get a Grip, is how I fell in love with this. And really, you have to understand who you are as a culture, what you want it to be. Um, we felt like we needed an actual uh, systematic approach to culture because it's also how we're gonna operate. What are our processes? How are they defined, simplified, followed by all, and documented? And then also an operating system offers the ability for you to really understand what your differentiator is. How do you attract, why would somebody want to come work for us and not another technology company? Why would someone want to partner with us in business and not another technology company? And it gives clarity to not only us, but then also to the people that we're recruiting and people that work for us and people that um, may choose not to be the right fit. Uh, so it just provides that clarity and we felt like we needed it when we were about 30, 32 employees, just to put it in perspective. So the books, so traction is um, really what we refer to instead of having that mouthful EOS, but you'll hear that acronym a lot. And that is more of a tactical approach to this methodology. Um, get a grip is, well, one, I don't read, I'm addicted to Audible, so you can find these on Audible if you're like me. But get a grip was also something that spoke more of my love language because it's really a fit fiction story of a company going through the realization that they needed an operating system. You're a fly on the wall, watching them live it through. So it's a story. And then once you go through that book, um, Traction can sometimes take a lap as book number two, because then it puts all the boring analytics and how it actually works and the details there. The stuff I'm interested in. Yes. And then what the heck is EOS? Um, this is directed more towards non-leadership roles. So we use this whenever we onboard new employees, when we rolled it out within the organization, but it's a watered down version that speaks to somebody that's maybe not big picture or in leadership or really caring about working on the business. They're more in the business, but it helps us all have that same um, vocabulary and things like that whenever we speak internally and we're using buzzwords that are all traction based. And then rocket fuel, that is, who's familiar with visionary and integrator and those types of roles? Okay, we're gonna touch on that a little bit um, later, but that book really is a way that visionary and integrator interact with each other and the purpose and understanding what that role is, the importance of it, when you're getting in one other's way or um, how to get out of your own way, how to delegate. It's a really amazing book and that's Rocket Fuel. So why EOS? Um, again, I was listening and I was hearing, it was kind of a big buzz. You'll probably start hearing about it a lot now that we've touched on it today, if, you ha if today's your first time. But 
we're a very analytical company and knowing that we're winning or losing or why we're doing something is very important to us. And so they really break down what every company, regardless of the industry, should be focused on in four different quadrants. Uh, vision, you have to have a vision. If you don't understand as an owner, as a leadership team, as an employee, whether or not your company is growing or are you trying to, to stay the same size and, and create a fatter bottom line or are you trying to position yourself to sell, all of the decisions that you make in day-to-day -day operations really drive back to that vision. So if you don't understand that or don't have one defined, that is the foundation of everything else that we're gonna talk about. Data. What are the scorecard measurements? What are the KPIs? What are the things that tell you day to day, um, I worked really hard, but I don't know if I accomplished anything. So they give you tools around how you actually measure the data. Process, are they documented? Are they simplified? Are they followed by all? Traction, they're very tactical in the rocks and the meetings and the meeting structure and the agenda and all of the things that go into not having a meeting that should have been an email. And issues, issues are opportunities, so there's some other tools and things throughout um, this philosophy that allows you to take conversation and move it to the next step. We found ourselves moving a lot of dirt around by not having some clarity and discussions on things that really needed next steps, and we had the conversation, and we went back to, back to work, and <laughs> nothing ever happened, and then it's like, I thought we talked about that. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, I like to say business isn't hard, people make it hard, but they also make it awesome, and that is our number one asset. But understanding what that DNA is of those people, who is going to thrive in your environment, and why, and who's not, and why. And then making sure that once you have the right people, you're also making sure that they're in the right seat, and they give you tools around making sure you can identify clarity in that as well. I know I'm driving her crazy because I've got this right now. So, uh, <laughs> a little bit of a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, okay, so now into the culture piece of this. So we tried to break this into five steps, improve your culture, if nothing else. So going back to vision, why does your company exist? I touched on that earlier, but you really have to, to identify this. And it's, it's hard and it's scary because I want to exist for all these different reasons, but Getting clarity there is really the foundation of this of business. Um, where are you headed? What's the company DNA? Yeah, this is actually so the, the why does your company exist? We did this in 2019, whenever we launched it, we actually went back through and asked ourselves this question again. You do it every quarter, one, yeah. but this time we all were like, this just doesn't fit. What we were saying before doesn't fit. We need to re-evaluate re, uh, what this looks like. So it's an ongoing thing, ever-changing. Another reason why we chose traction um, is because it literally lays it out in the first chapter. Hey, if you're a growing company and you know you're going to change, this might be a really good platform for you, right? <clears throat> All right, so establishing a game plan. So again, I'm more of the tactical person. Uh, Ex former football player. Yeah, yeah. formal football Lee, player. Lee was so in the I Sports Hall of so. Fame for Missouri for 55 touchdowns in uh, one season. That is correct. Yes, thank you for bringing that yes. up. So thank you. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about 10 years. What? Yeah, it was Pee. Sorry, yeah, it was it was Pee Wee's Elementary. I apologize. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so. Uh, one of the things for me that makes this really awesome is going through this process. Once you've established why you exist, why your organization exists, then you start with your 10-year BHAG. Does anyone know what that stands for, BHAG? Who? Do you know it? It's your goal to be very compatible with your audience. Not, okay, I haven't heard it say that. Thank you. That's good. I will be using that from now on out. But we call it audacious goals. Uh, so since I'm being recorded, I'll, I'll choose that one this time. But that's awesome. Yeah, that's exactly right. So there's not really any rhyme or reason to this. So if today you own a coffee shop and you sell 100 cups of coffee every year, in 10 years, if you just killed it and you achieved something just unbelievable, what would that look like? Well, it may be we're going to sell a million cups of coffee in 10 years, right, And it, for that year. Um, whatever that number is. So we define that. No analytical backing, just we're going to chase something that seems scary. It needs to be scary, right? Then you walk backwards and say, okay, three years from now, if we were successful in a trajectory to get to that 10-year target, how do we, or BHAG, sorry, how do we get there? What does that picture look like for us as an organization? What departments do we have to launch? What branches do we have to do? What new lines do we have to, to uh, roll out? 
Then from there, you walk back to your one year uh, target. And so at this point now, we're saying, okay, one year from today, what does it look like to be successful? All right, this can be a revenue number, it could be a profit number, it could be a person number, it could be you know, whatever it is that helps drive you to say this is what this is. And then you define that tactfully with like, hey, like here in a second we'll get to our org chart and when we first started, and in fact it's still this year, I'm sorry Kinsey, I like to move, okay? So, uh, okay, so uh, I was sitting in multiple seats and so it, one of the targets for this year for us is get Lee in one seat, let Lee focus on one thing, not multiple things. So walking through practically, it's building out a Joplin branch further. It's uh, adding another uh, branch uh, in other places. So all those things are things we're saying, we're gonna accomplish this this year. Here's what it's gonna do for us to hit our goals and our things. So we walk backwards into that. Then you take it into the quarterly rocks and it's a little more than just quarterly rocks. But again, this gives it teeth and traction on a quarter by quarter basis, right? So you say, what am I gonna accomplish over the next 90 days? And most of us have heard of this. The reason why it's called rocks is basically for a year, you've got four containers. Each container is 90 days worth of stuff, right, that you can accomplish. And the goal would be, we would start with the most important things. What are those things, those things you know you have to get done? Then you'll sprinkle in what would be like, if you put it in a jar, the pebbles, the things that like those day-to-day -day things that we all have to do, they're just a part of our job. They're not those biggest driving forces, but they're just a part of it. Then you're gonna add that sand, and I'm sure everyone's seen this at some point or another maybe in their life. If not, then you add the sand afterwards, and that's all the things that we end up doing that Chelsea puts it, you end your day, and you're like, well, that was exhausting, and I don't think I accomplished anything. That's probably sand, right? So it's like, it's all these things. So then you take that next 90 days. You accomplished all these things. You started your whole 90 days again. If you were to put that sand in and then the pebbles, you'll find that your rocks don't fit. So uh, 90 days earlier, you were actually able to accomplish a lot more things because you started with these most important pieces. And so we as a company actually launched this company-wide and have everyone establish rocks, but we start with our leadership team to say, what is it that we need to chase over the next 90 days? And then through that, we handle it off into what we're gonna talk about in a second, which is the quarterly conversations. Core values, so these are, well, I love to say DNA. What are, the, what are the core values that make up the people that are gonna help carry these goals out? And how do you define those? And so we were probably guilty at one point in our <laughs> history of doing the same thing, but it makes me cringe when I think of organizations that have their core values, trustworthy and honest, and they're painted on a wall or a plaque, and it's like somebody told them that you had to do this to get your business license, and nobody knows what they mean, and they're just the cringe. So we went through an exercise with a consultant whenever we started this to establish real core values. We threw the old stuff that <laughs> <laughs> for the business license burned in the them. trash, burned it. And, um, and so it really helped us, and so we're gonna go through a little ex exercise as a team, but it really helped us identify a true living concept of what a core value should be. So you have a little note pad in front of you and a pen. And what I want you all to do, Lee's gonna show kind of an example, leave a little space. Yeah, you wanna have a little space in there. I'm sure, I don't know if everyone can see that, but she'll explain in a second. So when you start with the names, you'll have it, don't write them yet, just, just know you'll want about that much space in between each name that she's yes. gonna tell you in a second. So I want you to think, if you were to take over the world in business, name three people that you would hire. One has to be working within your organization at minimum. Um, and the other two preferably, thank you. Yep. The other two preferably would be working within your organization as well, but they can be outside your organization. So go. Mm -hmm. And if you're sitting by someone from your organization, don't feel obligated to write their name down. In fact, <laughs> don't, don't write don't, their yeah. name down, right? So, <laughs> and if there's only two people inside of your organization, you can choose three different people. The point here is to pick three people that you know, if I started a business tomorrow, these are the first three people. If I had unlimited resources to hire whoever I wanted, who are the three people in your life that you would say, these are the people that I would hire? And your name can't be one of them. <laughs> She's erasing one right now. She's laughing. She's like, nope, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Great choice. Yeah. Okay, now you're gonna follow that up with why. 
What attributes or characteristics made you select that person? And the reason for the space is that where you can write, you know, ideally two or three per person. What are two or three things that make that person so awesome in your eyes? Did you write my name down whenever we did this? I did not. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> did you write mine? <laughs> I don't remember who I wrote. And I promise we're not going to say, okay, now burn it. We don't care. Uh, there's, a, there's a point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll go like 60 more seconds. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're both so competitive, we're wondering which name you wrote first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so at this point, what we did as a leadership team is our consultant didn't care about the names. What they cared about are the were the characteristics and the attributes that we had all selected. And so he started whiteboarding everything up. And then we looked for commonalities and recognized that even though we all had a slew of different people, people that none of us knew, I mean, our leadership team at the time was like 50% of the company. <laughs> it, was, no, it was a lot. But um, we started going through and saying, all right, where are the biggest commonalities? And made sure that we came up with five that we all agreed on. And then if you'll move to the next slide, these are ours, and then we started putting some action to them. How do you live the core values every single day? So always accountable, is a positive influencer, has people smarts, that's the person that knows when to be right, um, not afraid to be transparent, bringing things to light, asking the question, being curious uh, for the sake of the betterment of the organization, not to be the whistleblower, stays hungry, some people can be really hungry some days and not other days. And so the, it really just started to put it into a living perspective. Yeah, and so the, the practical piece of this would be, like if anyone's ever been a part of like building core values, if you just start from scratch, it is tough. Like go Google, Google good characteristics and yeah. it's exhausting, right? You pull that up and you're like, how am I gonna pick out of these? This gives it teeth. So for me personally, the one I can definitely share is my father. So I specifically remember my father and my three characteristics were hardworking, honest, humble. So it's very easy for me to be like, boom, I remember those three words. I remember writing those three words. And so it made it super practical. Now, could I have come to those three characteristics? Maybe, but that gave it teeth. And to me, it, it made it more impactful whenever I look at these and I'm assessing our team through what we'll talk about in a second, our quarterly conversations, because I know what hardworking looks like. I know what, and I would call that, you know, staying hungry. Um, you know, I know what being humble looks like, and so I can define it based off of those things. So again, the point would be take this back. If you are on your leadership team, if you guys have struggled with this, if you don't believe, or if you don't have core values, listen, I'm not gonna say easy. There was some good discussion and debate that occurred during our process of it, Healthy but it was still fun. Okay, so then once you've now established your vision, you've set some targets and goals, say this is what we're gonna accomplish, uh, you said some core values, say this is the, what a, the right person would look like for our organization. Now it's time to fire everyone and start from scratch. So this is way harder than it seems, uh, especially for Chelsea and I, we're both very relational. Uh, but you literally sit back and say, if I started my organization from scratch today and I had to support $10 million worth of this with this many clients, what does it look like? And how often have I put someone in a seat because they're just really good at it. And when I say seat, I mean a, a role or a place, right? Or how many people are sitting in three to five and carrying the weight for others, which we've also found in several spots. So once you've built out that structure with no names attached to it, 
then you start assigning your names to it. And this was a gut-wrenching, tough, tough process whenever we walked through it three years ago. So, yes, uh, very humbling because I was the guilty party of making job descriptions around a person's skill set. And it became very clear at that point in time that if they got hit by a bus, there was no way humanly possible that we could post that position because it didn't exist. I was just like, you're good at this, this, this. I mean, it, yeah. So it's, it's humbling. And then you, we also, we had uh, 12 people on the leadership team yep. at this point. So if you were a department head or um, a manager, you sat in this group and you'll see in a second, there weren't that many spots for leadership. <laughs> So it's, yeah. it's humbling, but it works. Yeah. yeah. So this is it. So this is actually our PKT leadership team. And she and I are the only people that were at the organization at that time. Um, and really, the only role that we had was defined probably was my seat, which was the, the director of sales seat. Everything else was Chelsea, 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 uh, which is not super scalable. Oh. Okay, so uh, it was kind of a, a, one of those things that whenever we recognized it, and to go back to her story, this is just FYI kind of funny information, but Chelsea came into my office as she does often uh, because she audibles books and I don't learn uh, audibly. So I have to read it, I want to touch it, I want to feel it, I want to make notes in it, right? So she retains the nuggets she wants and she's good and she's super excited and says, I figured it out. I am an integrator, and my dad, who was uh, a partner in the business, uh, was the uh, visionary. And she's like, that's why we kind of go back and forth and some of these things. So we sit down for day one and kind of establish, he says, hey, first thing for EOS, you have to have a visionary and an integrator. And then we need to break it down departmentally, what are your, what are your departments? And EOS suggests that either it's really just these four. Every organization pretty much runs the exact same way. Sometimes sales and marketing is combined. So that's how they break it apart and say, this is where you start with. Uh, so we're sitting across from each other and he's defined what a visionary is and what an integrator is. And again, I'm a director of sales. I've been a director of sales for two years um, and was a sales rep prior to that for uh, four years. Um, so no reason to be saying this, but everyone gets up and I say, uh, I'm going to kind of rock the boat when all 12 of these other people who have been here longer than me and are, uh, you know, probably more skilled than I am and most of them smarter than I am and everything else, right? I'm like, but you aren't an integrator, I don't think. Like, I think you can do it, but you hate all the things it drives to be an integrator. Those are not what drive you or what excites you. Um, I think you're a visionary. And she was like, I'm having that exact same epiphany right now. Uh, so I left that, that meeting and called my wife and was like, I don't really know what my job is anymore, to be honest with you. I think I just accepted a different position that's not really defined, so, and I'm probably not qualified for. So, uh, but that is really actually how this, went about and happened and we immediately then started saying okay how do we get ourselves because it was me and her and we were in all these seats except for one uh, how do we go and recruit people to get into these seats how do we go find the right people to help lead these departments um, so so and they call it the accountability chart within traction and so one of the cool things is it's your org chart essentially <laughs> but the way that they map it out they don't put titles. Titles are ego, okay? So we still use them, president, CEO. But they, um, but they're really, it's the function. So it's the function with the five roles, the five main roles that that position is responsible for. And it provides a lot of clarity too, whenever you, you know, job descriptions are great. We still have them. That's the more detailed version. But really when you're thinking of what is a C and when you're mapping it out, it's what is a function and what are the five primary roles that this function should be responsible for 80% of the time? And that provided some additional clarity. So this is what quarterly coaching sessions kind of look like for, for EOS. Um, so again, kind of the, the tactical piece of this, so if you're like me, you, you like seeing it and be able to understand it, but it's very simple. Um, I would sit down and, or Chelsea would sit down with Lee and say, okay, is Lee most of the time, that's a plus, some of the time that's a plus minus or most of the time not this core value. And we have a bar that just says you're either three pluses and two plus minuses or higher or you go into a 30 day improvement plan. Um, Standard. Exactly. And, and the goal here isn't to say you're wrote up and we want to get rid of you. It's to say, hey, how can we help you get right in these things? 
um, and that way we can do it. You also can move on to that based off of the bottom here, the get it, want it, or capacity to do it. Were you gonna add something? Yeah, I was gonna say, and sometimes somebody is below the bar because we as an organization have created that. So it really helps that dialogue, and the purpose of this is not to necessarily say if you're below the bar, it's because you're a, a bad employee. They may, we found situations where we've had somebody not be a positive influencer, and through that quarterly coaching conversation, we recognize, oh my goodness, their team, their, their team is a skeleton crew, and we have them running around trying to backfill all these positions. Of course, they're not gonna be positive. Now we have that feedback so that we can address it. So just because someone's off in one of these things um, is not a, a bad thing. It's really to help get us all on the same page because we view employees as a partner. People have to choose working for you, and they choose us as much as we choose them, and so it's a, you've gotta have that peer-to-peer -peer accountability. Yeah, and it really just breaks down to this. Right person, right seat. If you're the right person, great. Is there a seat available for you to work in this organization or not? Right? So if there's not, unfortunately, we probably need to help you find somewhere to work that does have that spot. You're still a killer person. We'd love if we ever open up XYZ position to hire you back. Right seat, we put you in the wrong spot. We gotta get you moved, right, to, to the right spot to it. Touch on gets it, wants it, capacity. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, so gets it, wants it, and capacity to do it. It's just yes or no. So do you get your job? Do you understand all the ins and outs of it? And so in these, the um, leader will fill it out and then obviously the employee as well. So it also shows where we don't connect on some things, uh, which is fairly often whenever I'll say, hey, you're a plus or minus and always accountable, and they'll say I'm a plus or minus and stays hungry. And so it's like, okay, well, what did you mean? But we really meant the same things. We were just assessing it a little different. They felt like they were failing one, uh, one place or the other. This is, if you're a no in any of this, we gotta, we gotta get onto it immediately. There can be no no's. Um, it has to be, we gotta define this. We need to set a rock. Um, I actually have, rocks this quarter uh, based off of this, based off of these meetings with my leaders um, where they basically told me something, said I don't know, um, I don't know that I get my job. I don't know that I understand this. I thought I was in charge of this, but I'm not. I'm like, great, well, I'll start a rock. Let's sit down, let's talk about it, and let's define this to where it makes sense for both of us. Um, and if it's not what you want, then great, let's find out how we can get you either somewhere where you want to be or in a position inside the organization where you want to be. So basically, when you walk out of this room today, the five main takeaways that we want to reinforce are pick an operating system. There's a ton of philosophies out there. It doesn't have to be EOS or traction. I mean, I kind of feel like they owe us a paycheck for talking how great they are today, but uh, we don't work for EOS. But, um, but there are several out there, great game of business. Uh, do your research, find out what's right for your organization, but pick one. And then make sure that you have that vision defined. Again, it's the foundation. You've got to get that vision because everything else is a byproduct of starting with the vision. Defining your core values. What's that DNA? Who do you need to add to the team to carry out the vision? Who do you need to remove from the team that's not going to get you to your goals? And then that structure first. Do they align with the values? And people second. Sorry, structure first is where you're not actually... Um, picking people and creating job descriptions out of them. Structure first, people second, and then use it and live it. Those quarterly conversations hold that supervisor or manager accountable to having these conversations. Um, the, the scorecard, everybody has a number. Every employee has at least one number to where they can leave at the end of the day and say, I accomplished something, or I need to ask for help, or I'm confused. Have a number. Yeah, and so, I mean, good example is Ken's. What's one of our core values? Oh, Brock. Brock. He's hiding oh, back there. <laughs> so, teach him, work him, right? Kyle, what's our 10 year BHAG? 100 mil. 100 mil, right? So, that's where we're headed. That's what we're doing. That's what we're striving for. Okay. And I only planted two of those, so the third one didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, uh, giveaway. So, uh, if you have not given your email address, I'm looking at my marketing coordinator, making sure that I'm saying all the things correctly, then you'll want to get with Lindsay and she'll take your email address. One of the things you can do is uh, actually get some of this information. Can you yep. Anna White this a little bit you for bet. a second here? Okay. Good, so it won't look just like this as a printed out copy, but it'll get you a couple of the tools that we use just to kind of initiate. And again, you don't have to do EOS to necessarily do these. 
The first one is the organizational checkup. It's kind of the first step into EOS. And again, it's if you're the owner of the organization, you may fill this out on your own at first, but Chelsea brought it to our entire 12 person leadership team and we all filled it out and then we all gave our answers and it basically does a little algorithm where it tells you what's your score in all six of those categories she talked about. Um, so it kind of tells you where are you the weakest uh, so that way you can kind of focus on those areas and again, it shows you what tools there are to do that. So if it's people, then you probably need to define some core values. You probably need to get some right people and right seats defined. And so it kind of helps you just know what would be my next steps to, to help me get better at that. It's also great to reinforce um, as you go along and work on some of these things. So not only do you now have a priority list and check, but then have your team continue to take it. Do Again, it's like another like mini assessment. And it basically breaks down those five dysfunctions of a team. He breaks it down to say, hey, like the foundation is trust. You can't have conflict. If you don't trust someone, you'll hold back um, because you're afraid of how they're going to react to those situations. So uh, it's another great tool, something we've used internally, something, again, that's helped. And again, that's something you can use departmentally to help others define maybe where they feel like. We've had areas where we were mad about the results, which is the, the top piece of it. Well, they didn't trust each other. So we're like, great, we're probably not gonna have the results that we want because we can't even talk about our issues uh, openly. So hopefully you guys find those helpful. Again, if you get your email address to Lindsay, then she'll be able to get that. Uh... Oh, and you can scan this QR code. So da I And download, yes. So, if you scan yeah. that, it'll have all of them in a digital format to where you can download those as well as uh, we were able to negotiate with Traction and you all can get a free book of Traction. If you fill out your information there, they'll ship it to you. That's correct, yep. And then we opened this up, so I know that we're like five minutes before time, uh, but we wanted to give everyone an opportunity to ask questions if you have any questions um, so we can be here. Before, uh, before we do that really quick, because he walked in because I love the dude, so Austin, can you wave your hand? So if everyone could just say thanks to Austin, he let us host it here, This he owns Zinc Coffee, so thank you Austin, we appreciate it. He's a Joplin, well, he's a web guy, I don't know if I can call him a Joplin guy, that may, I don't know, may fight after this if I say that, so. Also my cousin, so he had to. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, cool. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. question I can say extremely so one of the reasons we didn't talk about this but recruitment alone um, you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier uh, but it's very simple for me to recruit somebody now hey we're going to 100 million here's our five core values are you driven for that does that excite you like do you want to be a part of something like that and there's lots of people who say no it's like cool this would be a huge disaster for you then. You are extremely talented, and if we change those things, I will keep you in mind. If Chelsea decides to say, hey, we're super profitable, um, and we don't care about growing at all, and she wants to just keep the money, great, uh, then our 10-year our BHAG would look a whole lot different, right? Uh, and so, so would our core values more than likely on that piece of it. But from those things, it's just helped us be able to manage and lead people in a much better way, and I, I don't know who still does, like we used to do at the end of every year, our assessments looked a whole lot different, and it was like 40 questions that was like, score yourself from one to five, and I'm not, sorry if anyone here loves those. I hated it, it was a disaster. I hated giving them, like half the questions I felt like contradicted each other. So having this system made it super simple to be able to coach people to lead their teams. Um, and again, I'm not saying that it's just EOS. I think that an operating system in general is good. Have something that helps you um, set some boundaries for yourself to know, okay, this is how we'll go about doing this. EOS itself will tell you, once you hit 250 employees, you may have outgrown it. There are people who use it that are bigger than that, but there are a lot um, that don't. There are some people who only use it for their department, not organizationally wide, but they define, uh, and our team, like our sales team, has their own DNA. So our director of sales starts with five core values, BHAG, does that excite you? Are you in? Do you want to work for an organization like that? And then he says, oh, by the way, now you want to be in sales. This is what it looks like to be a salesperson at Pearson Kelly. Do those things drive you? 
and I don't know those, so I can't give any <laughs> examples of them, but I do know that that's a conversation he has every, every time he brings someone on or discusses them and, and uh, make sure that those are driving forces and things that, characteristics that they could get excited by. And some feedback that I would provide, um, we turned over, so statistically, if you start this, they say that you'll turn over 20 to 25% of your staff. And I was like, there's no way. And we did. Mm -hmm. And not all at once, but, um, but we did in hindsight. I mean, it was the right thing. We needed to shift things up. We needed to have the opportunity to really have clarity. Uh, I would also say this is not uh, you do it overnight. When the consultant started working with our team, he said this is an 18, to two year, 18 month to two year process. So we started for about three quarters just for the leadership team and then started to spoon feed. We did a launch with the employees, explained what we were getting ready to do, and then we did book club with that what the heck is EOS to where every employee was reading one chapter per day, which it's really, it's like three pages and font 24. And so super easy read with questions that then they'd have to get with their supervisor and we would talk about what all those things meant. And I said one day, we did that over the course of 12, there's 12 chapters, 12 weeks. Yep. And so spoon feeding and digesting, um, it takes more time for people that it, it turns out to where it's like two years. And we didn't even have everyone in L10s up until probably a year or two ago, which is what they call yep. their meetings. Yeah. And now they can literally add a, what they'll call an issue, which can just be an idea. It sounds negative, but it's not. It can be just an idea. And literally everyone in our organization can do it and they can send it to leadership. So when we sit down to software, when we sit down, you never know <laughs> what's been added or what someone's upset about or what idea somebody has and they can track us to respond. So all those things have been super impactful. And the tools, it helps us like before, I feel like there was a lot of moving around dirt and trying to have conversation about things like this person's toxic. Well, I don't know, they work really hard on my team. And well, did you hear what she said the other day or she continues to find herself in everybody's drama. Now it's like, hold please, people analyzer, take them through. How do they stack up against our core values? Okay, there we go. Now we have a way to measure and it's less subjective and it's more objective. Really good question. Yep. So there's another philosophy called scaling up that's like an overcooked version of this. And what I didn't like about um, that particular philosophy is that it's done to where you're like, you are a slave to that consultant forever. And so the traction implementers, um, they are taught to kind of wean you off. So in the beginning, we did use them facilitating, teaching us how to do it and then he would come in, I think, once a quarter yep. after that, and to the point we, we weaned him off after like 18 months, yeah. I think. He, I couldn't imagine us like saying you're not on leadership anymore. <laughs> so if you're doing this by yourself and you said, hey, by the way, we had 12 people in leadership, now we have three, four, uh, whenever we were done. Yeah. Uh, like that would be tough when a consultant does it. <laughs> he's like, well, this is the system. This is how we do it. It was probably a little easier conversation yeah. um, because he has reasons why, right? Um, We've, we know some people who've tried to launch it by themselves, and it usually becomes, we really drank the Kool-Aid. We really yeah. launched it. Now, we've tweaked some things. We've changed some things. We've tried to make it more us. And again, that's EOA. It'll say, you're going to change. You're going to grow. You're going to do things. We're going to continue to do that. So um, Jay, I mean, in two years from now, I may be like, well, it was stupid. We got rid of it, and we so, started something yeah. different, right? <laughs> so you may be totally right. And if you have a homegrown, um, maybe I misspoke earlier, that's fine. If it's working and you're not struggling to recruit and everyone understands the process and you're effective and profitable and everything like that, keep doing it. Don't change for the sake of change. But if there are some struggles in clarity or you're trying to um, expand or understand maybe different generations and how they work and what's meaningful to them, 
if it doesn't do all of those things or provide that clarity, then that's when I would say look maybe at some other tools. And I'd say what frustrated me about the old way was that it wasn't documented either. Yeah. So it was a lot of tribal knowledge, a lot of, well, this is the way we used to do it, or someone who's been there for 12 years would tell me about something. I'm like, I, yeah, you're right, but that was eight, that, we've never done that since I've been there, and I've been here for six years. I'm like, so you're thinking of something that you did prior to me even getting to this organization, which we don't use anymore. So this helped us to be able to implement this company-wide, where we didn't have those departmental deals where that stuff was happening, and it, and it made it very difficult to manage from a high level. And I'm speaking for Chelsea as a, I, my department had theirs and we were, I mean, candidly 2019, we were having our best year ever and we were rocking and rolling. So when she brought me this, I was like, yeah, I don't care. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. I mean, that was pretty much my exact response, right? Yeah. I sat it on my stack of books that she had already given me and I said, cool. Actually, I put it at the bottom. I said, I'm going to get to it when I finish these other four books that I haven't started. Uh, so, and, and I would move it a, back to the top. She would, yeah. Uh, so, so that was literally, I mean, that's, that's the way we've operated. So, anyone else? Personally, in our agency, just kind of touching on what you said, when my father in law started it, he wanted it to be different. He wanted it not to be like everybody else's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what she brought from that other agency that had been around for 30 years was at 10 years old they did the same thing, right? They would kind of fly by the seat of the pants and let's just hope it works. Uh, the good old boy system, which is still good, right? Yeah. Plus we think well, not, not and be able to be easily have understand the why or where or, you know. Yeah, growth is great, but if you don't know where you're growing, you don't know where to put your marketing dollars, you don't know where to put So if I'm Chelsea, so some of you have multiple owners in an organization, which it was her and her dad, which her dad, again, has been, he was our first ever core value MVP um, because he's super humble and said, it's Chelsea's vision. So that was also part of it. Like if I'm Chelsea, what's really scary is if it's Lee's vision, she can fire me tomorrow or I can leave tomorrow. She's bound to this organization, right? So she can sell it, she can do whatever she wants to, it's hers. But all of us are here and excited about her vision. And that is scalable. When it's my vision and it's somebody else's vision, it's somebody else's vision inside the organization that doesn't have that same like ownership aspect of it, it's a dangerous place to be, especially if you're the owner of the organization. Because that person can leave and there goes your vision. There goes your, your the, the, the loyalty to the organization. She and I talk about, I talk about this a lot. It's like, appreciate the loyalty. In fact, our annual last year, we, I started with this. Love that you guys are loyal to me. You have gotta be loyal to her. It's her baby, I can leave tomorrow. I can, I can bounce, I can get out of here, she can fire, she can come in tomorrow and say, I hate EOS and I don't need an integrator, and she can get rid of me. I would appreciate if you didn't do that, uh, you know? But she could, and it's like, so that's part of what, again, I like that relationship and that piece of it is because it does define it. It also can be humble for some of the leaders that want to take that and be like, well, it's mine. It's like, it's not. <laughs> the vision is hers, these are the things right, that, that drive Pearson Kelly, so. Or Cole, to your point too, with the, um, you know, working hard and it'll come, that, that's a philosophy I was raised on. But once we defined that we wanted to be scalable, it also takes some of that back and forth out of the conversation when someone's like, we're not big enough to overcook this process and we've always done it this way and it works. And it's like, yeah, but if we're doing 100 million in 10 years, this process is not scalable. And so, but sometimes um, you don't need to change it. It's just prioritizing what you're after and ours is scalability and duplicated 
and being consistent in our processes and you can have that conversation when service manager or you know IT support doesn't understand why it's like this is why mm -hmm. yeah if someone comes up with a I'm not gonna say a dumb idea well I've said dumb idea now so that's not fair but a, a not scalable idea we now just say 100 bill because 100 mil isn't big enough so we're just like 100 bill and then they know that doesn't work that's not scalable like you're building a custom thing that's not gonna get us to where we're gonna go and again if your organization does that that doesn't mean it's bad like you just probably have to define a different 10 year target, that's awesome, right? Ours just looks different. Any other questions? I didn't want to make a comment that I wasn't just trying to be negative. No. The reason I'm here is because of what's happened over the last few years. Uh, like I said, we're a mature company and our employees are either below sick or leaving because their retirement age. Mm. I did a presentation on that where it used to be the buzzword uh, work-life balance. Yeah. And I was like, no, not anymore. It's work-life integration. Yeah. And it's get the job done, but on your terms and how you work best. And as long as you can show up and be accountable to the workload that we need you to provide, like we'll work with different. So true story, uh, whenever I was, and I, I'm so sorry. So, but when I took this position, so this is, like the epitome of what it would look like. So when I took sales manager, my boss, who was my mentor for forever, right? Um, he and Chelsea were on the phone all the time at night. Like she loves working at night. I do not, I get up at 4 a.m. and work. So she gets three, I'm four asleep. hours. I am asleep. Yes. Uh, so so that's, that's, that's the way I, I work. But I told her, I'm like, I got a wife and I got three kids and my nights are for them. And so before you give me this position, because he had made that recommendation, like you need to understand, like I'm not gonna change that. So I know a lot of people who are your sales manager, or sales director, or president, that's not gonna work. And so just don't, don't put me in that position, or don't hire me, or fire me, or whatever you gotta do. But I'm not gonna change that, because that's my integration. Like I promised my wife and my kids I'm gonna be there, and one day they'll be gone, and I'm not gonna give that up. It just is what it is. So for that, um, she was super okay with it and she sends me about 20 messages at 7 to 10 p.m. and she gets about 20 messages back uh, from 4 to about 6 a.m. Uh, so that's kind of how and, and it works right I mean, we've made that that work and um, so